Hi everyone, thanks for watching this video. My name is Elise Garrick and I am the Health and Wellness Education Lead at GBS Benefits. I am also a Certified Health Education Specialist and a Certified Personal Trainer. Today we're going to be talking about Know Your Numbers and the purpose of this presentation is really to prepare you for when you go to the doctor and you get screenings done, you get a lot of information back and it's going to be diving into all of those numbers, that information, what that means for you, how you can improve or maintain those numbers. So we're going to talk through all of the details together. Here is a brief agenda for our presentation. First, we're going to talk about building a case for awareness, why it's important to be aware of these numbers and the importance of preventive care in general. Then we're going to talk about understanding the numbers themselves, their impact, and lastly, what you can do uh, once you receive your screening results. So first, I'm going to start off with just a few true or false questions. The first one is, the purpose of a preventive care visit is to make sure I'm healthy. So think about that for a second, true or false. The purpose of a preventive care visit is to make sure I'm healthy. The answer to that is true. The purpose of a preventive visit is to look at your overall health, identify risks, and provide helpful information to stay healthy. Preventive, preventing disease before it starts is really important to help you live a longer and healthier life. And a preventive checkup can detect early stages of disease. And that's a good thing. That's when you wanna catch it is when it's early. That's when it's easiest to treat health problems and um, when they can be identified. Here is another true or false. If I feel fine, I don't need to see a doctor for preventive care. True or false. If I feel fine, I don't need to see a doctor for preventive care. The answer to that is false. The best time to think about your health is before you get sick. An hour spent at an annual checkup with your doctor can help you stay healthy and identify issues before they become an ongoing or serious medical condition. Also, developing a relationship with your healthcare provider is really important as well. Even again, if you're average 20s, um, you don't experience a lot of risk factors, you feel like you're a generally healthy adult, it's still important to develop that relationship so that your provider can know you personally, know what is normal for you, and they can also tailor results or um, tips, tricks, whatever it is, to your specific situation. Preventive care. So in general, this helps identify health problems and risks when they're most treatable. It also helps improve the quality of your life, reduce healthcare costs, and better health overall positively impacts our communities and our economy. Preventive care is generally provided during a well check or annual preventive screenings with your primary care physician or family doctor. And during this visit, you and your healthcare provider will determine what screenings are appropriate for you based on your age, your gender, your personal and family health history, current health status, potential other risk factors that you might be experiencing. Most plans cover preventive care at 100%, meaning there is no cost to you as long as you're receiving care from a, from a provider in your plan's network. Um, something to note here is that sometimes screenings or tests can be coded as diagnostic instead of preventive, which wouldn't always be covered. So before you get anything done, you can always ask your doctor how they're planning on billing this or calling your doctor's office ahead of time if you want to avoid any of that. Um, I want to talk through a brief example here, specifically during COVID. A lot of people delayed or canceled appointments, especially more discretionary preventive care ones, when healthcare costs went down at large, but we missed a huge period of early detection opportunity for early intervention. So a lot of people were delaying those. And after this happened and people started going back to the doctor when they felt a little bit more comfortable doing that, they saw a big spike in later stage diagnosis for conditions 
which not only had a negative impact on health outcomes, but it was also very expensive for people. So that is a situation we're trying to prevent by going in for these typical screenings so you can again treat diseases and conditions early on. Some of the things that we're gonna talk about today are these screenings here. So generally in a basic test or a screening with your doctor, you might get your glucose taken, uh, your blood pressure, get a lipid panel done, you might get your waist circumference taken, and each of these have their own indicators or health results if untreated. But again, they can also help predict, predict the risk for things um, like disease, heart disease, stroke, metabolic syndrome. And we're going to dive into all of those into more detail just here in a few slides. So screenings, again, are great, but it's important to be knowledgeable of the results. Even if your doctor calls and says, hey, you look great, no need to be worried, you might be interested where you fall on that scale or chart and what you can do to reduce your risk even further. So again, we have just a couple true or false questions before we dive into the specific screening numbers. First, in 2021, hypertension was a primary or contributing cause of 500,000 deaths in the U.S. True or false? This is false. Hypertension actually contributed to more. It was a primary or contributing cause to 691,095 deaths in 2021. True or false, nearly half of adults have hypertension. True or false. This is true, nearly half of adults have hypertension, 48.1%. And hypertension we're gonna talk about in detail on the next couple slides. So hypertension is also called high blood pressure. Let's talk about these numbers that you see on this graphic. The results are presented in the form of a fraction with a number on the top and a number on the bottom. The systolic blood pressure is the top number, and that refers to the amount of pressure experienced by the arteries while your heart is beating. The number on the bottom is called your diastolic blood pressure, and that refers to the amount of pressure in your arteries when your heart is resting. So that's how they get those two numbers. Uncontrolled high blood pressure increases your risk for a lot of things like heart attack, stroke, hypertension, cardiovascular disease. So it's something that you want to be aware of. And it's also something that you have the opportunity to measure regularly. So this isn't something you need to go in and get your blood drawn for, um, have that sent to a lab. It's something that you can do at home if you get a blood pressure cuff, even sometimes you can get it done at the pharmacy. You can look up videos on how to do that with a manual cuff or get the automatic cuff, which just allows you to put your arm in and press a button. Um, so again, it's something that you should know what that number is for you. And you can see here again on the chart what range equals optimal versus hypertensive crisis and everything in between. Optimal is less than 120 over 80. So let's talk about what you can do. If you happen to know your blood pressure or if you're worried that it might be high, here are some things that you can do to improve those numbers. The first thing is knowing your risk factors, knowing what things you can change and what things you can't. So non-modifiable things, things that you can't change include your age, ethnicity, sex, and family history. And those can all have an impact on your blood pressure numbers. Modifiable things that you can change if you smoke, your diet, your exercise, if you have high cholesterol, those can all impact your numbers as well, but you are able to change those through things like lifestyle changes, like uh, exercise, um, diet, medications. So that's what we're going to talk through next. Lifestyle changes, uh, participating in activities that you enjoy, like spending time in nature, practicing deep breathing, spending time with family and friends and animals. This is going to correlate with that third bullet point, managing stress, because as you manage stress, you're able to reduce your blood pressure, 
Stress activates your sympathetic nervous system, sometimes called your fight or flight system, which can increase your blood pressure. So you wanna find things and techniques that help you manage your stress. Also limiting alcohol, quitting smoking can also help lower blood pressure. As far as diet goes, you wanna focus on a balanced plate of variety of foods each week, like fruits, vegetables, whole grains, dairy products, and also try to pay attention to how you feel after you eat certain foods. Can you tell that your body feels sluggish and slow after eating something, or does something make you feel energized? And then lastly, medications. Medications may be needed to control heart disease symptoms, prevent complications, or manage hypertension, but that's something that you should talk to your doctor about just to determine what medication, um, if that's something that would work for you, and what would be appropriate. Okay, now we're going to move on, and we have another true or false question. A hemoglobin A1C test should be done about once a year. True or false? This is actually false. You should get a hemoglobin A1C test at least two times a year if your blood sugar is in the target range and stable. If your treatment changes or if your blood sugars have not consistently been well controlled, you should have one done every three months until your blood sugar level improves. So obviously we're gonna be talking about glucose and A1C for the next couple of slides. Getting your blood glucose test done measures the amount of sugar called glucose in a sample of your blood. And glucose is a major source of energy for a lot of cells in your body, especially your brain cells. Um, something to note here is that elevated glucose levels can be an indicator of diabetes. So that's why we want to get this done. A1C measures the average level of glucose over the three-month period. So again, this is something that can indicate, this is usually measured in people that have diabetes, but it can also be something used to uh, get that initial diagnosis of diabetes. So here on the charts, you'll see on the blood glucose one on the top that there are two different values, an optimal fasting, optimal non-fasting, elevated fasting, elevated non-fasting, and so on. So this is a test that can be done fasting or non-fasting. So when you look at these numbers, it's important that you know which test you had done so you know which chart to look at, which ranges to look at, and what's appropriate for you. And A1C is measured in a percentage because it is an average. So you can see down here at the bottom, less than 5.7% is considered optimal versus pre-diabetic and diabetic. And what can you do specifically with these numbers? If you want to maintain or improve them, the first thing again is going to be knowing your risk factors. A lot of these things are going to overlap from test to test. So first, knowing age, ethnicity, sex, family history, gestational diabetes, and how that increases or decreases your risk for diabetes. Things that you can change include smoking, diet, exercise, high cholesterol numbers, high blood pressure, if you experience a significant amount of stress. And then things that you can do on a day-to-day -day basis include prioritizing sleep. A lack of sleep or poor quality sleep can lead to unstable blood sugar by disrupting hormones that control your blood sugar. So you want to try and focus on getting a good amount of sleep, which is sometimes easier said than done, but trying to create the proper routine, the proper environment can be helpful here. Practice stress management. Stress activates the sympathetic nervous system. Again, we talked about this with blood pressure. It can also cause a rise in blood sugar. So you want to find techniques that help you manage your stress, deep breathing, hobbies, things you enjoy, also engaging in physical activity. This doesn't always mean a lot of strenuous exercise, a lot of time spent in the gym, but choosing an activity you enjoy that's going to keep you coming back for more. And also finding support from friends, family, um, your doctor, talking to them about groups that can help you find support, talking to them about what you're experiencing and how they can help. 
As far as diet goes, eating regular meals and snacks throughout the day, not skipping meals will help prevent those major fluctuations in blood sugar levels. And then also combining carbohydrates with fat and protein during your meals and your snacks is important here. Glucose is the number one source of energy for our brains, and that comes from the digestion of carbohydrates. So if you combine fats and proteins with your carbohydrates, that helps slow down the digestion and allows for a slower, more stable release of sugar into the blood. Um, again, try to notice how your body feels after e or eating certain things. Um, that can help you figure out what works for you and what works for your body. And now we're going to move on to the next test, the lipid panel. This test helps determine your risk for things like heart disease and stroke. The American Heart Association recommends all adults age 20 or older have this done every four to six years. Um, after we talk about our risk factors and lifestyle changes on the next couple slides, you might get a feeling that that number is different for you because every person is different. So again, talk to your provider to determine what range and what time frame is best for you. So our two charts here are gonna talk about total cholesterol and triglycerides. Total cholesterol is the amount of cholesterol circulating in your blood, just like it sounds. And triglycerides are a type of fat in your blood. High numbers have been linked to cor coronary artery disease. So again, that's I wanna explain why these numbers are significant, what they're linked to, why they matter. Lowering your cholesterol and triglyceride level may slow down and reduce or even prevent plaque buildup. And the plaque buildup is what can contribute to heart disease, stroke, that kind of thing, as your arteries tend to um, become smaller and it's harder to get the blood, blood flowing through them. Another thing to note here is that it's important to remember total cholesterol is useful, but it is an incomplete gauge of the risk for heart disease. So that's why we're gonna talk about LDL and HDL levels here on the next slide. LDL is sometimes called bad cholesterol, and that contributes to the plaque buildup in your arteries. HDL is sometimes called the good cholesterol because it removes extra cholesterol from your bloodstream to your li liver and helps get rid of it. You can see down here at the bottom that um, these numbers will be different for male and female, and that's something to note there, but this is the same type of thing, optimal to high for both LDL and HDL. However, because LDL is called bad, that means you want less of that, so optimal is less than 100, whereas HDL is something that you want more of, so greater than 60, you want more HDL. Lastly, we're gonna talk about this ratio. So total cholesterol divided by HDL cholesterol. Together, these numbers provide more information about coronary heart disease risk than knowing only one of the numbers. In general, the higher the ratio, the higher the risk. So you can see here at the bottom, and I'll separate that by male and female between optimal and high. So what can you do? Again. Knowing your risk factors, uh, there's a lot of overlap here, age, ethnicity, sex, your family history, things that you can change include smoking, diet, exercise, diabetes, stress. Some lifestyle changes are going to be very similar to the other ones we talked about. Exercise, finding joyful movement, things like taking a walk after dinner, riding your bike, playing your favorite sport are all great ways to get exercise in. Smoking and drinking alcohol can increase your LDL numbers. So that's something you want to try to manage or quit doing. Chronic stress, again, can contribute to increased LDL numbers. So managing stress through exercise, medication, therapy, whatever modality you prefer. And that's something, again, that you could talk to your doctor about and they can help provide some tips. As far as diet goes, we want to focus on unsaturated fats. So these are mono and polyunsaturated fats that come from things like fish, nuts, seeds, 
and oils like olive oil. These are foods that are all rich in omega-3 fatty acids. And that is a type of fat that does not affect LDL cholesterol. Also increasing fiber, which is found in things like oatmeal, beans, apples, pears, that can help reduce the absorption of cholesterol in your bloodstream, leading to overall lowered levels. The next thing we're gonna talk about here is metabolic syndrome. So I mentioned this very briefly in the very beginning, but we're gonna circle back now that we've talked about a lot of these different measurements. So metabolic syndrome is a cluster of conditions that increase your risk for heart disease, stroke, and type two diabetes. Metabolic syndrome diagnosis is based on having three out of the following risk factors. So having a high screening number in one of these things. We've talked about all of them except for waist circumference, which is one of the risk factors for metabolic syndrome, but also HDL levels, glucose, triglyceride, and blood pressure. Your medical provider will diagnose metabolic syndrome based on these numbers, medical history, family history, a physical exam, diagnostic tests, and knowing more about metabolic syndrome and other chronic conditions will just better help you prepare for future appointments, testing, and lifestyle choices. What can you do as far as metabolic syndrome goes? Knowing your risk factors, once again, age, ethnicity, sex, family history, coexisting conditions or medications, modifiable things like quitting smoking, adjusting your diet, getting lots of sleep, um, again, looking at those medications, finding an activity you enjoy doing often. Um, again, something that is fun for you, whether you do enjoy going to the gym and that is fun for you, or whether that is something more like playing with your family, going kayaking, going hiking. Also giving your body the rest and rejuvenation it needs, focusing on sleep quality by assessing your sleep habits, your nighttime routine, your environment, really aiming for six to eight hours of sleep. And then also discussing medications with your doctor. Medications to help manage blood glucose, blood pressure, cholesterol, cardiovascular disease risks, all of those things with your physician, um, seeing how they interact with each other, just being aware of all of your medications as you get things added. Maybe you need to adjust some of the other things. It's a good discussion to have with your pharmacist or your doctor. Um, for nutrition, focus on plant-based sources of fat. This is similar to what we just talked about. Things like nuts, nut butters, seeds, olives, olive oil, um, fish, and then again, aiming for fiber-rich foods to include with each meal and snack. Things that can be found in grains, oats, bran, peas, vegetables. And especially with this fiber piece, it's important to stay hydrated. So drink plenty of water as another good tip here. All right, so as a summary for what you can do, a lot of those things overlapped and I wanna talk about just in general rules, what can we focus on? Because that was a lot of very specific details for each test. So first, consuming a variety of fresh colorful foods, trying to get a balanced diet is really important here. Moving daily, incorporating joyful movement, things that you enjoy and that keep you coming back for more. Limiting or avoiding using substances like nicotine, drugs, alcohol. Developing stress management strategies, uh, whether that is meditation, exercise, hobbies, time with family and friends, time outdoors, whatever works for you. And taking advantage of preventive screenings appropriate for your age and sex. Those are recommended for a reason. So it's important to talk to your doctor about what that looks like for you and what it would what would be important and impactful for you. Establishing a relationship with your primary care provider. We touched on this earlier, but again, they can just know your situation. They can know what normal is for you if you see them regularly. They can have a good um, take on your, your history. They can know what you've gone through before. 
and how you've reacted to certain things. So it's important to find someone that you feel comfortable with that you can ask questions to. And then lastly, setting goals or intentions and tracking your progress. You've had all of, if you've had all these screenings done and you don't remember your numbers, you don't even know where to find them, that could be a great place to start. Just knowing your baseline, where you're starting, and whether or not you want to maintain or improve those numbers is a great place to begin. On this slide here, we have a couple of resources. You can scan these QR codes. Um, the first is information about incorporating more mindless and mindful movement into your day. So we've touched on this a lot, but just finding ways that you enjoy moving as well as mindless movement, which kind of refers to um, just more movement throughout the day, walking around, taking a break during work, taking a lap around the office, taking the stairs instead of the elevator, parking a little bit farther away, just so that you get some extra movement throughout your day doing your regular routine things. Uh, the second piece here is an intro to our Atomic Habits campaign. And Atomic Habits is a really popular book written by James Clear, who discusses techniques to create lasting behavior change. And he breaks everything up by four laws, which he calls make it easy, make it attractive, make it obvious, make it satisfying. And you can use that framework of Atomic Habits to institute some of these changes that we've discussed into your routine or really any habit changes you'd like to make. But this is a great place to start. He talks through a lot of really actionable techniques and strategies that will help you turn these things into habits. Thank you again so much for watching this video. If you have any questions, feel free to email us at wellness at gbsbenefits.com. We'd be happy to help you answer your questions or direct you to the right resource. And we hope that you enjoy and share this video with your friends and family.